like to announce my candidacy for the presidency of the United States. <laughs> Can you imagine that? How oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a quick death. <laughs> I talked to Ryan earlier this morning and, and obviously it's a great honor to kind of not back clean up, although this is the last in the message series we've been looking at, but, but I was thanking him for the privilege once again of coming and sharing the word with you, and, and he, he left me with this. He said, Mike, you should be able to teach this one fairly well because you've been doing it for your entire professional career, which was a very gratifying word. And I see some of, of my former students here today, those that, that I've had a chance to continue to work with post graduating, and, and uh, so I'm really honored by their presence. I just want to tell you, in a, this is a very intensely personal message. So I'm not going to apologize for the fact that I'm going to be talking about me <laughs> and my family. I don't want to take too much time, but I'd like us to go back and look at the slide that talks about where we've been over the last four weeks. We've been talking about the development of a healthy home, and I'm going to suggest you a healthy culture. And I think in, there's, a, there's a sense in which I get sometimes when we develop sermon series, and we call it the development of a healthy home, that some of you who are not still parenting, or some of you have never been a parent, somehow feel like some of the principles we've been talking about are not necessarily a part of your life. But let me suggest to you, you are a neighbor, amen? You are a coworker. You are a friend. So the things that we've been talking about in terms of trying to, if you will, raise up godly kids and now in my sense, godly grandkids, we're talking about principles that transcend just the home and look at the broader culture. We started talking about spiritual conversations, which is constantly talking about what Jesus is doing in your life. We talked about developing and contending for a biblical worldview. And sadly, and this is, one of the, this is one of the things that happens in my life because I am so intent on knowing what's going on around me in the culture. My father used to tell me when I was a little boy, he said, you should read your Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Because this, the Bible, is going to help you make sense out of this, what's going on around us. Because quite frankly, in the light of what's going on in our country in the last week, ain't nobody here in this room can make sense about what's going on in this culture right? It makes no sense. In fact, somebody sent me on my, uh, one of my social media platforms and they wanted my opinion about what we should do about the events following the shooting this week. And I said, I, I don't have answers to that, but I will tell you this. I can tell you why there's evil in our culture. And I quoted Romans 3.18 because there's no fear of God before the eyes of man. And needless to say, my phone began to blow up. And it was everything I can do. I mean, I told you I was going to be intensely personal today. It was everything I could do. And in fact, I tried to do it. To respond to the congressman from the state of Arizona, who in the wake of the slaughter of those children, not only was critical of a sitting senator from the state of Texas, but also one of our congressmen here in California, because they very proudly and very publicly declared that they were going to continue to pray for the families in Nuvalde and the families of those that, and, and his response was not just profane, but it disgraced his office and dishonored that place, that standing that got it. And I, I, I reached out to his office only to be kicked off the social platform because I don't live in Arizona. Nobody should have the opportunity to mock the church of Jesus Christ because we believe there is a God who hears us and will respond to our prayers. 
That's contending for a worldview. And we talk about covering our loved ones in prayer and what that means and how I've been praying for my children and now my grandchildren and, and many of the people who make up the fabric of my life. And then calling for encouragement. When you see, for example, we'll talk about this in just a minute. In fact, might, might as well talk about it now. One of the most famous passages of scripture in the book of Proverbs is Proverbs 22, verse six. Many of you know it. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Sound familiar? All right, remember, folks, let me give you a little theological lesson here today. Proverbs are generally true. You can't force a proverb to be true in every situation. Witness, Proverbs 16, 7, which says, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. How'd that work out for Jesus? I'm just saying, in general, that's true, right? But the word train up, in Hebrew means to create a thirst for the things of God. And when you are brought into a relationship with either your own child or someone else's child, or you have the opportunity of, of teaching in whatever context it, it, it has been, for me, every level, from elementary school through Bible college, uh, I've had the, the privilege of teaching at over my last four decades. But the reality is that there are times that you are going to have to just create a thirst for the things that God reveals to you about the individual and the special needs, the special gifts, the special talents that God pours into their life. My children are decidedly different. I, the best thing I can say about my children is that they love each other. And they're each other's best friends. But my children are very different, and so when Cindy and I were raising our kids, we understood them to have a, a, a separate bent than one another. They were distinctly different talents and abilities that God poured into their life. And so our responsibility in, in calling forth by way of encouragement the gifts that God had given them, providing for those talents. And so our, one of our kids went to the Orange County Performing Arts High School and spent four years in high school honing her ability to, to act and continues even now in community theater and so forth. The, uh, another one of our kids, highly intellectual, she got it from her mother. <laughs> and we made special opportunities for her to go to different classes because we saw that bent in her. That's what we've been talking about, but today we're going to we're gonna wrap this up and we're gonna talk about modeling our faith, consistently modeling our faith. And on the, on the screen behind me in just a minute, we're gonna take a real quick, real quick look at the duties of the parent. And I'm gonna to suggest to you, some of you are surrogate parents, some of you have been thrust into mentoring roles, you may not have any children of your own, but you have had the opportunity to consistently pour into the lives of other people. What is it that we do? And the, the scripture right there is that foundation scripture about this is what a healthy home is going to do. It, when, when the winds blow and the storms fall and the floods rise because we've created in our homes a foundation in which people know that they're loved. They know who they are in Christ. They know that God is empowering them by the spirit. They're able to withstand all the things that come against them. But real quickly, if you look in the Bible, there are six things that we are told to do by way as parents, and I'm gonna say significant people in the lives of others. The first is to teach. In Deuteronomy chapter six, it says, you are to teach these things when they stand up and when they sit down, when they go out and when they come in. It has the idea of both formal and informal teaching. Second, we're called to train our children to create a thirst for the things of God. Let me tell you how that worked in our family and one of the things that historically in this country was happening. My, my, my daughters were, I believe, 12 and eight when Justice Thomas was confirmed to the United States Supreme Court. And I don't wanna belabor that, that, that story. I think most of you remember some of the things that went along with that. It was not a time in my life when I was really prepared to discuss some of the things that were being publicly said about him as he was going through his confirmation hearings, but it was that moment, it was a moment where once again something was happening and you could take it and use it and build something into the life of your, of your kids. Third, provision. 
The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 14 that it's not the responsibility of the child to lay up for the parent. It's the responsibility of the parent to lay up for the child. Now as a grandparent, I take very seriously that I'm supposed to be leaving a legacy for my children's children. I only have really two consuming legacies left. You know what they are? I want to end well. And I want to leave something to my grandchildren that is much more valuable than whatever will come out of my wallet. And there's not a lot of that. (laughs) You can help that by contributing to the Michael B. Fole Retirement Fund. (laughs) Envelopes will be provided. Nurture and admonition, the idea of tenderness, a compassion, and a warning. Sometimes you have to warn people that the direction they're going is not a healthy direction. Fifth, management, which has the idea of discipline. And then finally, isn't it interesting that in Titus chapter two and verse four, when Paul is talking to his son Titus, and he's talking about what the responsibility of older men is to younger men, and older women to younger women, he says that older women in that time, in the first century church, were to spend time with younger women, teaching them to love their husbands and to love their children. Now see, we think that's instinctual, amen? We think we have these kids and we're just gonna fall head over heels in love with them the moment we see them. And for most of us, that's true, amen? But the idea that, that you could just have to put that by way of an admonition, put that by way of a reminder is important to us that the way we express our love to our kids and our grandkids, the way we express our love to our friends, the way we express our our love to the people with whom we work, the way we express our love and affection and and our compassion for the people with whom we live around is so vital. Cindy and I were walking home the other night from a, she she volunteered me, God bless her. She volunteered me to, to serve with her on the HOA of our, of our neighborhood up in Orchid. Lovely job, hello. So we go to these meetings once a month, right? And we come out of the meeting and we're walking up to our house, which is really only about three houses up from where the community center is. And there's this guy that's walking with us. And we get ready to move into our front door and say goodnight. And he says, and he stops and he looks at me and says, you're the pastor guy, right? How did he know? I have no idea. But you know what? When I tell people I'm a pastor, I don't want them to be shocked. <laughs> I want them to have seen something of consistent godliness in my life. Mentoring, modeling, is consistent in scripture. Christ before his disciples. The the prophets, James chapter five and verse 10, who modeled their message before the people to whom they speak. If you wanna read a book that will keep you up at night in a healthy sense, read Ezekiel. And see how many times in the book of Ezekiel there are these acted out messages that the prophet Ezekiel brought to the nation of Israel at a time when they desperately needed to be brought back into a vibrant place of of relationship with God. You certainly have older men and older women with younger men and younger women. I look at some of my students here today and people I've had the privilege of mentoring and I will tell you publicly the greatest pleasure, the greatest privilege and the greatest pleasure of my life has not been to be a senior pastor, not to have written books, not to have spoken internationally. It's when I look at them and they're walking with Jesus and they're giving their lives over to the kingdom of God. That is the greatest pleasure of my life. Well, there are the dogs. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) So mentoring is, is something that we, or modeling is something that we see throughout scripture. We're gonna put a couple of scriptures up on the screen now. These first two, 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles, deal with David. In 1 Kings chapter 9 and verse 4, Solomon is being spoken to, and the Lord says, If you walk before me as David your father walked, with integrity of heart and uprightness. 
then God goes on to say what he will do. Interestingly enough, walked in the, in the Bible, particularly in the book of Ephesians, particularly in the New Testament. When we talk about the word walked, it has the idea of lifestyle. It has the idea of a progression development of faith. It's the, it's the manner of consistency in which you live. Now, the second one, though, 2 Chronicles 17, 3, the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the earlier ways of his father David. Now, that's, that's interesting. The earlier ways. Now, we all know that David had not so shining moments in his life. Amen? And I, I want to tell you one of the greatest One of the greatest internal evidences for the authority of God's word is the fact that God does not keep the stuff that we would not want written about ourselves out of the Bible, amen? And so clearly we have David's, uh, the foolishness of David when he counted the number of his troops, when he had long been told that his trust as the commander in chief of the army was never gonna be in the size of the army, was never gonna be in the size of the armaments, was never gonna be in the strategy that he could come up to fight against the enemy. It was always going to be what? In God. And of course, we have the story with he and Bathsheba. I find that interesting. Earlier ways of your father David. And in the New Testament, 2 Timothy 1, 5, I am reminded, Paul writing to Timothy, another son in the faith, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which means without hypocrisy, it's unfeigned, it's, it's undisguised. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. That's high praise. Timothy was brought up in a home where grandma and mom consistently demonstrated their faith. I wrote to my kids and and I said, hey, I'm preaching this sermon the last Sunday of the month and I don't want a bunch of, you know, statements from you. I just want you to just give me one or two things that we did right as parents. And you consistently saw mom and or I or both of us do. And they all wrote back the same thing for some of them. For example, every one of them, I I don't even remember if my in-loves, my daughter-in-love and my two sons-in-love, I don't know if they responded or not to be honest with you. But every one of them said about my wife, their mother, their mother-in-love, that the one thing they will always remember about Cindy is that they would walk in at times throughout the day and they would find her praying for them. I tell you what, as her husband, I get that every day of my life, every morning of my life. When I get up and I let the dogs out and feed the dogs and make the coffee and she comes out and I kind of retreat now to the back bedroom where my, my chair is, and I spend a goodly amount of time reading the Bible and praying and so forth. I know that my wife is out in her spot talking to Jesus. And then my kids said, you know, obviously about seeing you and reading your Bible. And one of my kids said, and I was not shocked by this, but I, I, I was kind of gratified. And they said, you know, Dad, one of the things that I really have always been impressed by with you is you get along with everybody. Little people, old people, middle-aged people. I just love people. And that's left a lasting influence on my kids, amen, is to be able to spend time with people and, and, and to genuinely like them. So what do we model? We've talked about it throughout this series. What do we model before people in our life? Not just our children, not just our grandchildren, not just our neighbors, not just my students, not just the people with whom you go to work. What do we model by way of consistency? Let me give you five things from the book of Proverbs today. Proverbs, as you know, is the James of the Old Testament. More than 100 different people are mentioned in the book of Proverbs. There are five specific themes that are mentioned. 
that parents in the time of the Old Testament were said to have committed themselves or were called to a place of committing themselves to living out before their kids. All right, let me give them to you one at a time. Here's the first one. The courage to stand alone. The courage to stand alone. Proverbs chapter one, verses 10 through 16. The best example in the Old Testament, of course, is Daniel. One of the things that we have to model in our culture now is the ability to stand for what we believe when it's being shouted down all around us, amen? You, you have noticed that the church of Jesus Christ is not only minimalized now in public culture, but marginalized in what we can bring to the table. That does not mean that we should stop contending for the things that we believe, amen? But we have to stand alone at times. We have to stand alone. We have to stand for what we believe, even if it's not popular. You know, uh, Dr. King once said, the measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in the moments of challenge and controversy. If we could live a life without challenge and controversy, most of us would sign up, amen? There is no life without challenge and controversy. And if you're living it, then you're not living life. Because when we stand for what we believe, when we model that, we are making a statement that not only can it be done, but it's the right thing to do. Benjamin Franklin once said, in matters of fashion, flow with the current, in matters of conviction, stand like a stone. The courage to stand alone is something we need to consistently model to the people of our day. By the way, part of that is the ability to pick good friends, amen? Right? I wanna tell you something about my parents. My parents, I look back at my parents and there are a lot of good things. My dad, most of you know my dad lives with Cindy and I up in our new home up in the coast and he's 94 years young. And I remember growing up in a household where my parents had people in their home, our home, all the time. Uh, most of them, to be sure, were from the church. My parents went to the same church in Long Beach for 44 years. But I learned two things from that. Number one, my parents valued friendship. I wonder why I do. I love you, Eric. Number two, you know why I love seniors? Other than the fact I am one now. <laughs> You know why I love seniors? Because my mom and dad were the youngest couple in their church when Paul and I started going to church. Whatever my brother and I remembered about that, I think it was 1960, I want to say 1960, when my parents started going to that church. And they were the young couple. And I grew up in a church where my love of the hymns came. I grew up in a church where I learned how to work on Saturdays for church work day, and the only thing that really compelled me to go to church work day were the donuts. Can I get an amen? <laughs> but I fell in love with seniors because I found out real soon in my life that's where the wisdom is. It's those people with gray hair on top of their head. Number two, remaining open to the godly counsel of others. Remaining open to the godly counsel from others. Also, Proverbs chapter 3, the end of chapter 1. It's the idea of being sensitive to the Word of God. It's the idea of pulling people aside and kind of whispering in their ear when something they've done has not really met the person they really are. It's, it's that pulling them aside and, and talking to them and saying, you know what, that really wasn't your shining moment. We can redeem it, and God will. How people respond to reproof and correction tells you a whole lot about how mature they really are. We've all met people the moment you bring something of reproof and correction into their life, and it's based on scripture, it's not your own personal opinion. We've all met people who immediately become defensive and want to control the conversation, and we all have met people who refuse to admit they're wrong. That is not the hallmark 
of the mature man and woman of God. Remaining open to godly counsel. Third, is the ability to handle temptation in whatever form it takes. Turning the tables on the tempter, if you will. It has the idea of being able to live a life that stands, if you will, above reproach, not perfect. Not perfect. But beyond approach, that no one can bring an accusation against your character because the consistency of your character is such that that curse falls to the ground. It, it, it's about teaching people to run away. It's about people being taught to replace the old man, the unsaved man with the new man, the new man in Christ, who has a now different empowerment, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to be able to say no to that which the enemy would want to use to bring him into a place of sin. It has the idea of, if you will, not just running away and replacing, but resisting the devil by submitting ourselves to God. It's interesting to me, and of course, you know, I love the book of James. The book of James was the subject of both my master's and my doctorate thesis and dissertation, and I love it. And in fact, I was at dinner the other night with uh, some of my former students, and they decided they wanted to play Stump the Pastor. Very dangerous game to play with me. And uh, one, of the, one of the young men said, I'm going to open up my, my, my Bible to the book of James, and I'm going to quote something, and, and I bet you you don't know where it is. I said, bring it on, baby. <laughs> but James chapter 4 and verse 7 says, we resist the devil by submitting to God. So we run away. We replace the old man with the new man. We resist. We reach out and ask for help. But here's one that I think we need to tell people in our culture. We call the passing pleasure of sin. Sin for the moment is pleasurable. But afterwards, well, not so much, amen? We want to consistently model lives that say that while we are not perfect, we are beyond reproach. We want to consistently model lives that while we struggle too, as all of us do, the struggle is very real. I'll be honest with you that the biggest struggle in my life now is because I, I, I'm dealing with this, this issue with my knee and it, it, it's tough. And I, I remember sitting in the back bedroom about three, four weeks ago and I was, I was beyond the point of frustration because to get out of bed is such a struggle. And I have to keep... I have to get up and I have to start walking and just bust through that because if I don't, I'm just going to be sitting in a chair until such point as we go to whatever the next steps are to deal with it. And I am not a depressive individual. I'm not a person that, that is given to long stretches of time where I'm discouraged. And let me tell you something, I was discouraged. I was discouraged. Now, what I did with my discouragement, I went out and talked to, you know, who, who told me to buck up. Everybody's got something in life to deal with, you know. <laughs> Thanks, dear. I love you so much. You're just so special. But the reality was, is I needed to hear that because, you know what, there was that momentary period of time where I just said, you know, this is just too much. Not too much if we're dealing with it with the way in which God is called to deal with this. The fourth one is earning, spending, giving, and saving. In other words, how we handle our money makes a big statement about us. When I was a little boy, I, I don't know how many of you can relate to this. When I was a little boy, my brother and I used to get an allowance. Don't ask me what it was. I, I don't remember, right? And there were certain things I had to do. You know, there were those chores I had to do and so forth and so on. And it would come time for allowance, right? Right? And either my mom or my dad would, would turn that over to my brother and I. And with the expectation, even at a young age, when we went to church that following Sunday, guess what? You were taking an offering. I learned very early about not just the, 
the value of contributing financially to the kingdom of God, but I learned very early the joy of contributing to the things of God. To this day, at almost 67, the first check always goes to the kingdom of God. It is not anything other than something that has been worked out and demonstrated in my life for my life. Earning and spending and giving and investing. And you know, by the way, let's keep in mind in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, one of the things that Paul says there, he says, let him who steals, steal no longer, but rather let him labor with his own hands that he might have something to share with those who have a need. There is this sense in which we need to learn how to handle our money in a way that reflects kingdom values and the importance of kingdom projects. And the last one is this, the value of hard work. My mom didn't go back to teach school until I was in sixth grade and my brother was in ninth grade. But even when she went back to school teaching, you know, that value of hard work that I saw in her and my dad was so consistent. Like so many of you, my parents never missed, whether it was a, a theatrical performance at, at school or a game on, on, on the baseball field. Never missed those. My dad would go to work, come home, and he'd pick me up because for all the years I played baseball, my dad was either my, my manager or my coach, and my dad would drive me to and from. By the way, I will tell you that when we got home, there was no conversations about baseball. When we were playing baseball, there were, conver there were, there were, there were conversations. But when we got home, that was done. That was over. The value of hard work, somebody who would work five days a week, my mom in a classroom. My mom spent 21 years of her life teaching in the same classroom at the same school, special needs kids. And every year I look forward to going to her classroom and meeting those little boys and girls that were in her classroom and telling them how lucky they were to have my mom as their teacher. Because consistently she went beyond what was expected. Or my dad would go to work and and then he'd come home and Saturday was work day at the church and you know what, he might have wanted to sleep in but by golly, he got us up, got us in the car and off we went to Donut Land. <laughs> you know, the best thing to have up your sleeve is a funny bone, amen? But I tell you what, rolling up your sleeves and going, going to your work, whatever it is, makes an incredible testimony on the people that you're around. Let me just leave you with this as the, as the team comes. and when, when we're done today, I'm going to come up, I'm going to read you a story, which I, I probably have read before. But it's the legacy of one man in the, in the annals of American history and what his life by way of example left by way of legacy. But I want, I want to tell you this before we, we close this message. Is that the value of consistently modeling our faith may not bring us a lot of applause. It may not bring us a lot of attaboys. It might not bring us a lot of acclaim and adulation. But I will want to remind you of a story when there was Mike and Cindy living in Ladera for all those almost 20 years and there was a lady in my neighborhood who one day decided that she was gonna get in a knockdown, drag out, verbal fault fight with another one of the neighbors and the language got a little bit spirited. And uh, I was upstairs in our bedroom which overlooked the alley and I decided to go pay her a meeting. And I walked over to her house, walked through the back gate of her house, knocked on the door and she said, Mike, come on in. And I, said to her, I said, you know, I appreciate you. I consider you a friend, but you did not handle that situation well. That was not becoming at all. A couple years later, she moves. She comes and knocks on our door, lets herself in. That's the kind of person she was. I'm just coming in. 
sat down at a table and she said to me, Mike, I am a, I am a single Jewish woman who is an attorney. And I have no desire to ever become a Christian. But I will tell you this, if I did, I'd want to look like you. And I thought, wow, she needs help. (laughs) It's time for us to respond today. And so Pastor Adam's gonna lead us and then I'm gonna come up and and close with your permission and gonna share a, a, a particular story, so. Jonathan Edwards was a Puritan preacher in the 1700s. He was one of the most respected preachers in his day. He attended Yale at the age of 13 and later went on to become the Princeton College president. He married his wife, Sarah, in 1727 and they were blessed with 11 children. Every night when Mr. Edwards was home, he would spend an hour conversing with his family and then praying a blessing over each child. Jonathan and his wife, Sarah, passed on a great godly legacy to their 11 children. An American educator decided to trace the descendants of Jonathan Edwards almost 150 years after his death. His findings are remarkable. The legacy of Jonathan Edwards includes one United States vice president, one dean of a law school, one dean of a medical school, three United States senators, three governors, three mayors, 13 college presidents, 30 judges, 60 doctors, 65 professors, 75 military officers, 80 public office holders, 100 lawyers, 100 clergymen, and 285 college graduates. How can this be explained? Edwards was a godly man but he was also a hardworking, intelligent, and moral man. Furthermore, the author writes, much of the capacity and talent, intensity, and character of the more than 1,400 Edwards family is due to Mrs. Edwards. You make a difference. Your example is important. The influence that God gives you, gives you a sphere of impact that will continue to be the only hope for this country as we move forward. And we move forward with the hope of revival. We are God's plan A, and there ain't no other, amen? That's right. Y'all have a great week, see you soon. 